Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to welcome Lou Bernard here in Warsaw. Uh, when I was asked to introduce Lou, uh, I had this jumble of thoughts uh, with you know, various labels flying, DH, Digital Humanities, TEI, Oxford, Gentlemen. Uh, well, uh, I met Lou quite a while ago in the year 2000. Uh, in Prague at the summer school, so his first role towards me was the role of a of a teacher. Later on, I met Lou as a well as a me being the fan of the TEI and him in the Oxford fashion being one of the two immediate fathers of the TEI. Uh, uh, and later on, we cooperated uh, on the technical council of the TEI which uh, Lou is part of uh, still. until now, still, yeah. And, uh, and I do hope that he will remain a part of it for a long time to come. Thank you very much, Piotr. Thank you, Violetta. Thank you for inviting me once again to Poland. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. I'm very honored by the invitation. And I'm particularly honored by the fact that everybody's come, it's snowy, it's cold outside, and you want me to talk about the TEI. I started my academic career a very long time ago, very, very long time ago. Uh, some of you were not born when I started my academic career. And I studied English language and literature at the University of Oxford. And that was very interesting. And then I did some teaching in Africa, and then I came back to Oxford, and I had in the meantime acquired a wife and a child, <laughs> and I needed to get a job. <laughs> and uh, just as in other parts of the world, getting a job, if you have, even if you have a very good master's degree, uh, and a thesis on a very obscure and early 20th century author. Um, <laughs> even so, it's not easy to get a job in, uh, with those qualifications. So I was very pleased when a friend of mine, who was an economist, in fact, said to me, you know, you could get a job in the computing center. And I said, is there a computing center in the university? And he said, yes. <laughs> So I went down there, and it turned out, this was in about 1973, uh, they were interested, no, it was 74, sorry, 74, let's be precise. And uh, they were interested in the idea that uh, maybe these research students in the humanities departments might be able to profit from using this huge computer that the university had just spent a lot of money on. Mm -hmm. uh, but they couldn't find anybody who could speak to those humanities students in a language that they understood. <laughs> so I got the job. <laughs> uh, and that's the beginning of my career in digital humanities was really as um, a go-between. Uh, I used to find it very amusing that professors or students or graduates of English literature would come into my office or meet me at the consulting desk and say, well, I'd like to explain to you about my problems in literature, literary studies, and, you know, I'm studying this author, and, you know, he does this, this, and this, and I would say, yeah, I know, um, I did that. <laughs> and they would say, oh, <laughs> so you know a bit about this or that obscure piece of literary theory? And I would say, yeah. <laughs> and then I would tell them about how to use Fortran, <laughs> or how to write a program, or how to develop a macro, and how to use the packages that were being developed at the time. Anyway, this is a very long story, um, so I'm going to skip very quickly to the year approximately in the early 1980s, when I was really responsible for a, one of the first collections of digital texts, texts in computer-readable form, which we were beginning to build up in Oxford. And I noticed that there was a big problem with the computers of that period. They were all different. So the formats were all different. So whereas I can go to a bookshop and buy a book from 
any number of different publishers and I can read it, <laughs> no problem, might be in a different language, but I can still, you know, the pages turn in exactly the same way. This was not true of computer books. They were all different. So that's when I started to think, along with a lot of other people, really we ought to be able to do better than that. We ought to be able to define some kind of common standards. And that was the beginning of the TEI. What is the TEI? Um, it's the title of a very good book that I hope you'll all buy, <laughs> especially when it's been translated into Polish. Um, and when people talk about the TEI, actually they mean several different things. Sometimes they're talking about the specific institution or organization, which is the Text Encoding Initiative, but often they use it as a kind of shorthand to talk to some kind of social construct, a kind of club, or a religion, you know, or a fashion. Hey, I'm TEI, how about you? <laughs> but it's also a technical framework, it's a way of making, um, a way of identifying ways of thinking about texts. And of course, it has a, a social existence um, as a bunch of people who all think well, not all the same way, but who all have a shared understanding about texts and what you can do with them on a computer. So, it's all of those things, and I'm, in this talk, I'm going to be mostly trying to present it from a historical perspective in order to try, I hope, to shed some light on why it is the way it is now. So, as I've said here, the TEI was born into quite a different world from today. There was no World Wide Web, for a start. Mm -hmm. I, I think most of us would find it quite difficult to remember or even to imagine a world with no web. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't even a channel tunnel, <laughs> though they were beginning it in 1987. There was a political state known as the Soviet Union, some of you may remember that, um, which had in this year launched a great space station, Mir, and also suffered a most awful human, human disaster in Chernobyl. Uh, amongst the great records of that year <laughs> was uh, Run DMC's version of Raising Hell and Graceland uh, by Paul Simon. A terrible song. Um, of course, at that period, if you did any serious computing, you did not do it on a thing like that. You did it on a mainframe. Apart from you, sir, who has actually used a mainframe? Apart from me? Nah. <laughs> okay. Nevertheless, some of what went on in those days, if you looked at it again, you'd say, oh, I see, because some of it is quite familiar. Even in the, uh, the late 80s, there were disciplines which were called things like corpus linguistics and artificial intelligence. And in those research communities, people were already aware of the need to work with large-scale digital textual resources. Of course, what they meant by large-scale um, is perhaps a bit different from what we mean today. Uh, the first language corpus of any size was the one million words, one million, <laughs> brown corpus, um, which you know would fit on a micro drive ten times over. Um, it's not in the same ballpark as Google's 500 gigawatts, but it was a large scale, more than a human being could read. <laughs> At the same time, there was an interesting, um, there were lots of interesting technical developments in the general area of text processing. Pioneering work was being done in using computers to construct dictionaries. The Oxford English Dictionary uh, began for the first time to contemplate the idea that maybe its ground, you know, its, um, its uh, what's the word I want? Never mind. Its, uh, its huge dictionary could be used and accessed and even sold in a digital form rather than on paper. And 
that dates from this period. At the same time, people were talking about ways of producing print through a computer using particular kinds of software. I've named some Tech, Scribe, t -Roth. These were systems for producing high quality, or what was considered to be at the time, high quality printout from a computer file. <laughs> there was, at that time, an internet. There was no World Wide Web, but there was an internet. And in fact, the first time I came to Warsaw was to, uh, was to visit, was to participate in a conference on the use of the internet um, and its expansion to Eastern Europe. And there was a lot of theoretical noise and discussion about this strange concept of hypertext uh, and non-linear reading. And there were two very familiar technical challenges already evident. The need to preserve data because, as we all know, computer files last, if you're lucky, for six months, <laughs> or maybe a year, if you're very lucky, and then they, be, they, they turn out to be in an obsolete format, or bits disappear. So you have to constantly refresh them. So there is that kind of problem. And then there are problems of data compatibility. As new technologies emerge and, um, uh, and evolve, so the result, the, the data stores that go with those technologies become mutually incompatible. And if you're thinking, oh, well, that's not true anymore these days, of course, we've solved all those problems now because everybody uses the web, everybody uses HTML, everybody uses the same two operating systems, or three, maybe. I, I say to you, have you ever tried to download an ebook from Amazon and use it on a different kind of ebook player. And I think if you have, you will say, yeah, maybe the format wars are still going on. So, in the spring of 1987, I always like to say this because um, I often give talks in France and the French like to be told that they invented everything. <laughs> um, don't they? <laughs> Um, so in the spring of 1987, there was a series of European workshops organized by a French historian, Jean-Philippe Jeunet, and a, a German or Austrian called Manfred Thaler, on the feasibility of standardizing the computer readable forms of historical data. People were beginning to do things like transcribe old medieval log books, not log books, account books, uh, in different form and analyze them to do history and historical analyses and they had noticed that different computer programs required different formats and that therefore it was not so easy to share the results of this work. So we had a, a series of very interesting workshops which I attended um, and we produced a report which was published in a German learned a journal called uh, Historical, I won't try to pronounce it, Social Forschung, something like that. <laughs> okay. And of course, as all good European initiatives uh, do, we then stopped and went to lunch. <laughs> but this article uh, was read by um, Michael Sproberg McQueen because he was a Germanist, he is a Germanist, and in the autumn of the same year, uh, he managed, together with Nancy Ide, uh, he managed to persuade the American National Endowment for the Humanities that this was really a difficult problem that needed to be the focus of an international effort. And that was the beginning of the TEI. And this photo here shows the attendees at uh, the first conference that was organized in a very, very cold and snowy uh, weekend at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie in upstate New York. Um, I don't know how, you can't really see the picture very well, and many of the people in it are sadly no longer with us, so um, I won't spend much time on that, but I will tell you, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, the conference was very interesting because, precisely for the purposes of this talk, I, I think it's important to understand this, this was a conference that brought together a number of people who had nothing in common, socially, politically, dis discipline-wise, 
in terms of their academic standing, except for one thing. They all wanted to use computer resources. They were all interested in how do you create textual resources for analysis and uh, processing on a computer. That's the only thing they had in common. I suppose you might also say that one of the other things they had in common was that they were kind of marginal from the point of view of their own disciplines. Because this was a period when doing stuff with a computer was really for weirdos. <laughs> it was not, this is before the web, this is before the idea that you have to create everything on a computer and share everything on a computer and do everything by email. Okay? Long before that. So these people were all slightly maverick, if you know that word. And that's why it was a very successful and very interesting conference. <laughs> so anyway, this is all, I'm just an old man telling you this. And those of you who are not old men should be saying to yourself, all right, so the TEI is old. So what? <laughs> It comes from a period before the web, before the DVD, before the mobile phone, before cable TV. It even predates Microsoft Word, for heaven's sake. <laughs> Not much in computing lasts for five years. Never mind, where are we now? 37. <laughs> so why should it be relevant today? Why should we think about it at all? And more significantly, why are you still interested in it? And I'll try and answer that in the course of this talk. The TEI, Text Encoding Initiative, the initials could also be thought of as short for Text Encoding for Interchange, and it defined its mission, as I've put it on this slide, and I've used this slide I don't know how many times to explain what the TEI is. And when I first used to use this slide, and I say, I used to say, as I still say, that the purpose of the TEI was to make it possible to create, exchange, and integrate textual data in digital form, every kind of text, every language, for any purpose, from any culture. And I would say this to an audience full of people who use punch cards, and they would laugh. <laughs> but this was before the web. And the web, of course, is a reflection of exactly the same motivation. So in that sense, we were ahead of the game. But there's another respect in which the TEI is really quite different from the web and quite different from uh, many other aspects of our modern, of today's digital culture. And that is that from the beginning, the TEI intended to provide recommendations and practice which was usable both by beginners who wanted to know, all right, tell me, what are the important things I really must know if I'm going to get on in this field? on the one hand, but also on the other hand, people who were expert and who wanted to do things that hadn't been done before. Right? What is research? Research is about finding answers to questions that we haven't quite formulated yet. So in that tension, in that tension between providing authoritative statements about well understood issues, on the one hand, and finding a way of talking about issues that were completely new on the other, in that tension, I think, lies some of the really characteristic uh, properties of the TEI that distinguish it from many other, uh, many other such initiatives. Um, in particular, note that the TEI was not intended to give you the right answer straight out of a box. The TEI was originally intended, and is still intended, to provide only recommendations where there is a consensus, where everybody more or less agrees that this is the way something should be done. And therefore to prefer general solutions to ones that really only work in a very specific discipline. But at the same time, supporting specialization, supporting extension into new areas for those um, for those expert users. And that's why the TEI doesn't give you a solution out of the box. You have to work with it. You cannot simply turn it on, as it were. Why was this necessary? I've already mentioned the rise and rise of data formats that are mutually incompatible um, as a consequence of evolving technologies, as a consequence, therefore, a new kind of digital 
Tower of Babel, which is still with us, as I said earlier, with reference to e-books. And it, there are plenty of other examples. So here's a brief timeline of the TEI, um, which I will now go through in slightly more detail, but here's a summary. TEI originally, as a research project, had two distinct, uh, quite well-funded uh, development cycles, one of which resulted in the production of P1, the first set of proposals. Uh, then we started to produce fascicles. We published in fascicles P2. It was never actually finished. And then finally, by 1994, we were able to move to the, the so-called final publication of the TEI, which was P3. Things then went quiet on the funding front for about five years, during which the TEI kind of established itself like a weed growing in the garden. Um, you know, we created this wonderful plant and we cast it out into the world and then all moved on to do different things. Uh, and while we weren't looking, that plant took root and became a part of the digital infrastructure, which meant that at the turn of the century, there was a need to establish a new, uh, something to look after the plant, and that was the TEI consortium, which undertook a revision of P3 first, uh, sorry, a conversion of P3 to meet the new XML standard, um, and then a, initiated a process of revision, which goes on to this day. Uh, this is the first time I've used the acronym XML, is there anybody in the room who doesn't know what that means? Don't be ashamed. <laughs> okay, good. I'll test you later. <laughs> okay, so the 19, the late 19, the period during which the TEI was most active, was, was formed, as I've already indicated, was a, an interesting historical period, a period of transition during which this idea of humanities computing or digital humanities was beginning to invent itself as a kind of interdisciplinary specialization, dialogue between specialists in computer science and the humanities. A fruitful synergy, you might say, between researchers and engineers. Which kinds of research? Well, people who are basically, I've listed the kinds of activity we're talking about here, People who were concerned with the creation and, and analysis of machine tractable text, that is, collections of textual data that can be processed in some useful way, corpus linguistics, literary studies, stylistic analyses, authorship studies, textual editing, that is, the, the old-fashioned, you know, the good old traditional uh, philological uh, tradition of producing jolly good books, jolly good editions of manuscripts and so on, all of that was migrating to computers at this period for various reasons. At the same time, there were res people doing research in language as a system, lexicography and lexicology, most obviously, but also in natural language understanding systems and generation systems, artificial intelligence, and so on. One of the other unusual and to this day not replicated features of the TEI was the fact that it brought very different disciplines together. The people, the TEI was originally sponsored by three learned societies. Um, two of them were really the forerunners of today's digital humanities communities. Um, but the other one was the American, sorry, the Association for Computational Linguistics. Um, and in those days, well, nowadays I think computational linguistics is really quite separate from digital humanities. But one of the rare things about, one of the unusual things about the TEI was that it brought these communities together, even though kicking and screaming they didn't really want to play nicely together. Mm -hmm. But that was one of the things that gave the TEI, I think, its unique flavor. And that, in fact, was down to two very particular gentlemen, and I, I always, I don't like to talk about the TEI without mentioning their names, particularly because they are both now sadly no longer with us. Antonio Zampoli from Pisa in Italy and Don Walker from Bell Labs in the US, who both had a vision of the importance of bringing together computational linguistics 
and traditional literary studies using computers, which is sadly not really does, it's hard to find people with similar vision today. Anyway, uh, let me press on. That conference in 1987 uh, produced what we rather grandly call the Poughkeepsie Principles. And I've given you a, a link here so you can go and look them up. And I won't try and read them to you. Uh, they're fairly obvious. The guidelines are intended to provide a standard format for data interchange in humanities research. They're also intended to suggest principles for the encoding of text. The guidelines should define a recommended syntax, define a meta-language for the description of text encoding schemes, describe the new format and representative existing schemes, both in that meta-language. These were principles that were worked out over the course of two days, bitter discussion, I mean, not bitter, hot debate. <laughs> Let's put it like that. Okay. And more or less, they have been adhered to ever since. Now, okay, that's Michael Sprobo McQueen is on the gentleman on the left, um, and uh, I don't know who the other guy is. <laughs> it's important to realize that the TEI was originally conceived as a research project. And so, as a research project, there were the equivalent of principal researchers at the center of it, answerable to, in this case, a steering committee that looked after the money and taking input from groups of experts who were mysteriously constituted from that small community of weirdos that I mentioned earlier as being the active players at this period. Basically, there were four working committees and two editors. Um, the four working committees are the interesting things because that's where the ideas that took shape in the TEI actually came from. The editors were responsible for knocking those, working those ideas out, putting them together, making them into a coherent form. And I'm going to say a little bit about each of the four committees, because I think that's interesting. So the first and most obvious, the Text Documentation Committee. Uh, the bits you can see at the top here are taken from um, an, a very, very old article I published in about 1990, I think, or 91, possibly, no, 1990, uh, explaining the TEI. I'm sure nobody does this now, but, you know, I used to, I wrote this article that explained what the TEI was, and then I just went around and presented it to about a dozen different conferences within the space of two years, slightly changing the title and slightly changing the content each time. So my bibliography looks pretty good, <laughs> but it's all the same stuff. I'm sure, as I said, nobody does things like that anymore. Anyway, that's where I, I discovered one of these uh, papers, and I've reproduced the paragraphs from it, so you've got a flavor for uh, the way we used to talk about the TEI. So the Text Documentation Committee uh, was given this rather interesting challenge. How should a digital resource be described? so that it can appear in a library catalog. You may be saying to yourself, well, why is that an interesting question? You know, we know how that's done. Uh, you know, our libraries are full of CDs and digital resources now, and they're all described in the catalog, just the same as the books. Well, it was not ever thus. <laughs> At this period, the libraries were only just beginning to wake up to the fact that they had to deal with these digital resources. And how do you describe them? They don't behave in exactly the same way as conventional print publications. They don't have the same properties. So this committee was groundbreaking in the sense that it identified the kind of metadata that librarians would be happy with, would be familiar with, would be able to add into their existing cataloging systems, and at the same time cope with the kind of metadata that the people who were creating digital resources thought was important for their purposes. And trying to do both of those things in one framework is not easy, let me tell you. So anyway, they invented the TEI header, which some of you may know. And originally the idea of the TEI header was that it would be the what librarians call the primary source of information. What does that mean? It means you go and look at it and it tells you everything you're going to need to know to put in your catalogue. You're going to extract from it things like the title of this thing, the person responsible for its intellectual content, 
the date it was produced, or the things that you would, in the case of a conventional book, take from the title page. But of course, on a computer disk, there ain't no title page. So, all sorts of interesting tensions come out of that, and if you look at the history of the way the header has evolved, and the way people have tried to describe resources on the web, the same problems keep coming up. On the one hand, the librarian wants to have everything just so. He wants or she wants to have the data properly organized in a consistent way. They want to see the name of the author given with the surname first and then the forenames and then the dates if there are any. You know the kind of thing I mean. And of course the researcher doesn't care about that. <laughs> the researcher just wants to say Bernard 1978, go figure. Um, anyway. Uh, let me move on to, in the interest of time, the Meta Language Committee, the fourth one, was rather different from the others. It was a very technical one. It was chaired, in fact, by uh, computer scientists. And their job was simply to define a language which we could use, or a syntax, if you prefer, uh, to express the, the guidelines that the TEI was going to provide. At that time, there was only one game in town, as Americans say, and it was called SGML, Standard Generalized Markup Language. Anybody heard of SGML? Janos, keep quiet. <laughs> Some of you have. Anyway, it's the ancestor, a rather distant ancestor of XML, and it was the only obvious candidate for what we wanted. And I only mention it now because <clears throat> from the beginning, we thought, the TEI said explicitly, in fact, in this document I've cited here, we will use SGML because we can't think of anything better. But as soon as something better comes along, we'll use that. And that's why, in fact, the TEI's formal structure is independent of its syntax as it is expressed. There is a, a different, the, the TEI has its own abstract model, which is expressed using Ta-da, the TEI. <laughs> and that makes it possible to map the TEI onto different concrete syntaxes for as these appear. So although originally the TEI was mapped into SGML, mapping it into XML turned out to be very simple. And when the next thing comes along that is better than XML, let it be soon, then we will be able to map into that equally simply in principle. Okay. <clears throat> Still going through the committees. The third one I'm going to mention is the biggest, the Text Representation Committee, which was charged with the job of doing, well, all the, all the stuff that we would nowadays think of as being um, basically uh, humanities computing, digital humanities. Its job was to identify and name what you might call, in a very sort of French phrase, the significant particularities of written text. There are things that an expert in any kind of text identifies immediately when they look at the text. There's a paragraph there, there's a heading, there's a chapter. Oh my goodness, there's a personal name. <laughs> All those kinds of things that we take for granted when we read, but which we need to make explicit for a computer to process. So that was the job of this committee. Text organization, significant variation in formatting. Now this is a, a whole topic in itself. When you look at any kind of text, looking at this one in particular, you may notice that there is a word on the screen in which I, which I have put in red ink. Is that significant? And if it is significant, what's significant about it? Um, it's probably not significant that it's red. <laughs> it's probably significant that I'm trying to emphasize it. And that distinction between what is important, that decision about what's important, turns out to be a not very trivial decision, okay? Which keeps coming back to bite you. In any, once you start using the TEI for any kind of pre-existing text, you will constantly be confronted with the question, is that the important thing I want to say, or is that the important thing I want to say? 
and there is no single simple answer. This is particularly true and obvious in uh, the case of the subject matter for the other major committee chaired by a theoretical linguist. Their job was to oh, just find some way of identifying and representing every kind of linguistic and literary analysis. Oh, easy. <laughs> Produce a list of all the linguistic systems conceivable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, of course, the range is impossible. And if you look at some of the early working papers of this committee, it's fascinating to see them gradually coming to terms with the fact that this is an impossible, really impossible task. And I've listed some of the things that uh, they first said, okay, we're going to consider all of these things. Um, and then they said, wait a minute. <laughs> Why were they given this absurd task? Well, absurd. Why were they given this uh, really difficult task? And for that, I, again, I, I want to put this in a historical context. This was a period in Europe when there was a lot of money sloshing around mm -hmm. in uh, research into what was called at the time linguistic engineering, language engineering. Um, I, I got into a long argument with a corpus linguist about what language engineering means. For some people it means political, um, a political system in which you organize things so that people speak the language you want them to speak. <laughs> all right? That's not what it means at all to me. Language engineering is simply the process of treating language in the way, uh, well, as, as, an, as, a, as an engineering problem. It's the process of defining dictionaries and language understanding systems um, uh, and grammars so that they can be tractable in a computer environment. For a number of reasons, the classic example being the Eurotra affair, um, the European Union was ready to put substantial money into making people who understood how to develop such computer systems in the private enter in the private sector together with people from the research sector in order to try and develop better language industries. Don't forget this is a period when the European, European Union was really starting to, um, how shall we say, uh, take to the water, uh, you know, was, was becoming active and already down there in Luxembourg and Brussels they had realized that well in Europe there are at least nine different languages and therefore we need to produce all of our documentation in nine different languages and that means we need help <laughs> and computers are there to do it. So although a complete description of all linguistic concepts might be a somewhat quixotic goal, the need to have it or the need to be able to do this kind of language processing work was paramount and that's why we were being driven to come up with complete lists of linguistic concepts that could then be mapped into these linguistic systems. So what did the TEI do? What it actually came up with was rather clever, and for this I give credit to Terry Langenden, who was the, the chair of this committee. They said, well, instead of trying to do that, we'll come up with a kind of meta-model, which can be used to represent any kind of linguistic annotation. Instead of saying, these are the core concepts, there is a thing called a noun, there is a thing called a verb, etc., we will say, you can talk about features, bundles of features, properties of features that can be organized and typed in various different ways and represented in XML. And we will also allow you to define a feature system, which allows you to put constraints on the composition and components of such feature structures. And in that way, you can develop systems that can unify, using a unification grammar, can combine data from different sources. And I didn't fully understand this at the time, but I do now eventually understand that this actually works. And that there are now, today, even as we speak, language translation systems that use precisely this approach to precisely this problem. So um, this is quite an achievement for the TEI as a research project. Anyway, the job of those two editors was primarily to bang people's heads together, as we say. That is to say, we had to apply Occam's razor. 
Do you know Occam's razor? Some of you do. The general principle that says if you've got two, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it probably is a duck, even if you want to call it a goose. <laughs> Um, so we had to do this a lot, uh, as you might suppose. However, we may not have achieved total simplicity, total organization. Um, and that's why, if you look at the TEI, you will find multiple ways of dealing with the same problem. For example, how do you segment, how do you identify, how do you carry out linguistic segmentation? How do you associate an annotation with your linguistic segments? It's not that the TEI doesn't, isn't aware of the, the problems associated with those activities. It is painfully aware of it. And it actually gives you two or three different ways of doing it, each of which is good in its own sphere. But it doesn't really help you a great deal if you want to know which one I should do today. <laughs> you have to, as I said before, you have to understand, you have to work with the TEI and look at what it suggests and decide which of the different strategies is appropriate for your needs. Right, from P1 to P3, I'm still doing my historical survey. So this is the title page of the very first version of the TEI, which appeared, it's a nice little slim volume like that, uh, which appeared in 1990, was printed in about a thousand copies and distributed over two years. And we immediately, on the basis of that, uh, started the next phase, for which we got quite substantial funding from the US, the EU, and the, even Canada. Um, and what we did in that second phase was basically fill in an awful lot of detail that was missing from the first set of proposals. <coughs> fill in in the sense that the first set of proposals were a bit sketchy in some areas, they didn't really go into a lot of detail. But also they lacked huge areas which were of tremendous importance to our target communities. So we, we basically started to pull all this stuff together and then in 93 we had a technical, the first of these technical review committees in which people came together, reviewed all of the proposals that had been made and decided on them. In 1994, in April, we announced that the work was complete and in May they actually were appeared, and that's me bringing the tables of the law down from the mountain. Um, in case you're curious, this gentleman here is a man called Charles Goldfarb. Mm. Ever heard of him? He's the inventor. He describes himself as the inventor of SGML. Um, and this was at an SGML conference, and this was, we were the first people to really use SGML to we tested it to its limits, I think, and that's why I took the, the copy of the green books and gave, it to the, gave them to him so that he had to put them in his luggage to go home instead of mine. <laughs> also in that year, at the end of the year, um, we held the first TEI Meta Workshop, that is the first training session, which we deliberately organized as a means of training people to train because we could see immediately that teaching the TEI was going to be a very, very big job for many years to come, and that the best way to do it would be to get a bunch of mad people together and infuse them with the idea of teaching the TEI, rather than simply doing it ourselves. Over the next five years, the TEI basically, as I said, grew like a weed everywhere without anybody doing anything about it. There was no continued funding, there was no continued development, there was no continued... Basically it was out there and if people liked it, they used it. And they didn't have to tell anybody that they liked it, they didn't have to pay for it, they just used it. Well, that's all very nice. So, various other things, I've marked some landmarks here. The, the uh, principal editor of the TEI, Michael Spoberg McQueen, went off to do something else. Uh, he worked in the definition of XML, even more important standard. Uh, we had a, a, an anniversary in 1997, and we realized by 98 that really we had to start thinking about migrating TEI from SGML to XML. We had one revision of P3 um, with some effort in which we fixed a few errors and typos and things, and we introduced just one new element. 
But the basic problem in all of this, I've said we rather casually here, who is we? Who's responsible for this thing that is now being published? There's no funding body behind it. There's no particular institution behind it. Who's going to take the responsibility of developing it and maintaining it and making sure that it continues to evolve in response to a very different and rapidly changing world? Who? Well, in the year 2000, finally we got the answer to this. Um, as a result of a lot of effort from some of the key existing TEI users, notably uh, Centres for Electronic Text and Centres for Digital Research in London, in the University of Virginia, the University of Bergen in Norway, uh, and the my own university in Oxford, we got together and we worked out a kind of a charter, if you like, and a business model even, for a not-for-profit membership association which was incorporated as the TEI consortium in the year, in the end of the year 2000 with the goals of ensuring that the TEI would be maintained over the long term and in the short term carrying out some urgent revisions such as bringing it up to date with new technologies, notably XML, but also expanding to include some important new subjects. I'll say very little about that. In 2001, the first annual meeting of the TEI consortium was held in Pisa, historically significant, uh, and P4, the sort of more or less automatic conversion of P3 to XML, was first distributed. Michael Sperberg McQueen was invited back to give a keynote on the TEI is dead, long live the TEI, and Sid Bauman and myself described the work plan for TEI P5. And in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this rather quickly, so, but you can come back and ask me questions afterwards if you want. So this is what some of these are in extracts from the slides presented at that conference. Of course, these slides are all written in TEI XML, right? So it's very easy for me to include them and seamlessly integrate them with all the rest of the material I'm showing to you, but you can't tell which bits are which, of course. Anyway, this is a bit of Michael's slides. Uh, in which he says these are the things we did right in defining the TEI. The TEI interchange format itself, which was a specialization of SGML and which in fact became XML. Uh, the TEI extended pointer syntax, this is a bit technical so I'll skip over that. The pizza model, which was the first attempt in the TEI to, to deal with the required modularity of the system. And the fact that the DTDs are not written but generated, that is to say that there is a, an additional layer of abstraction between the concepts expressed by the TEI and their realization in a formal syntax, such as an XML schema or a DTD. DTD? Anybody know what a DTD is? Nah. Grammar. Okay? A document grammar that says these are the tags you can use in your documents. And the other thing that Michael, I'm glad to say, picked up on as being something we did right was that we worked mostly by trying to persuade the community of users to express their wishes rather than going to the community and saying, here, this is what you should do. Instead, we said, what do you do? Right. And this is a kind of way of thinking and approaching a, uh, a difficult technical problem like deciding what are the right standards which really, need, which really distinguishes the TEI from a lot of other approaches, as I will say again at the end of this talk. Uh, I had, um, in my, mine and Sid's talk, we talked about all the things that we wanted to add into TEI P5, some of which you'll see listed there. In practice, I think the most significant new components in P5, by, with reference to P4, were the fact were the whole new areas in which we involved particular research communities. So there were lots of people who were interested in prosopography, what, what we jokingly called personography, uh, you know, doing something analogous to what you do for books in a bibliography, but with people and places, yes, and events even. 
So that wasn't present at all in any earlier version of the TEI. We worked very hard with the people who were experts in this domain to come up with sets of elements that could be integrated into the TEI. Similarly, there were no digital facsimiles in 1987. The idea of publishing a digital resource that simply consisted of graphic images wasn't there. So we had to work with people who were experts in that domain to come up with some recommendations for how you might handle them and integrate them into a TEI processing model. Similarly for physical aspects of documents, which we ruled out of court originally in the TEI. Um, and a very simple example of musical notation, which was also something that had developed independently, but which we wanted to integrate. Um, right, this is something I think possibly of interest. This is about the way the TEI is actually organized. Um, first thing to notice is this pale blue circle, which is so pale you can't even see it on the screen. Um, <laughs> This is the TEI user community, and I, I keep speaking about the community and how we're working for the community, and we're, it's a community-based effort. But how do I know who's in this community? I don't. Nobody does. Those are just the people who happen to use the guidelines. And as I said earlier, you don't have to pay, you don't have to sign up, you don't have to get a license, you can just use it. It's there on the internet. Go and get it and use it in good health. So the boundaries of that user community are very fluid and we don't know who they are. But there's a significant part of that community which is the people who actually put up some money for the TEI. Not a lot, but some. Either at an institutional or an individual uh, level. And those are the members of the TEI consortium as such. They are not numerous, but if it weren't for them, there wouldn't be any continued work in the TEI because they provide some money. What do they get in return for their money? In all honesty, not a lot. <laughs> they get you know, a good feeling, being good citizens of contributing to a worthwhile activity, and they get to vote. <laughs> Hurrah! <laughs> um, what do they vote for? Well, they vote for members of these two bodies, the Technical Council, and the executive board. The executive board is, um, as far as I know, well, it's the body that is kind of formally responsible for owning the TEI. So it's the management. Um, doesn't do a great deal. It meets every now and then and says, we should really do something, mm -hmm. um, basically. Um, there is the technical council, however, is a very interesting group of people, about 13. 12, 13, I can't remember um, how many there are. They are elected annually. Each person serves for two years. Piotr is a former serving member. After his two years, he decided he didn't want to stand again. <laughs> I can understand that. It is hard work, believe me. Uh, anyway, they, the council exists in order to maintain the guidelines using a whole raft of fairly complex computational procedures that have developed over, the ti over time. What does it mean to develop the guidelines? It means some fairly obvious things like fixed typos and errors, which people notify you of, but it also means handle proposals for change. Those proposals for change come from what I would call special interest groups, that is, people who are particularly interested in a given problem. So let's say that you're a member of the, uh, you are a leading light in, shall we say, the hot air ballooning industry, and you have noticed that the TEI, curiously, has no tags to talk about the loading of balloons. That's disgraceful, you say. And you meet up with all of your fellow ballooning enthusiasts, and you come up with a set of proposals for new things that should be added to the TEI in order to support ballooning. And you make that proposal to the council, and the council looks at your proposals and discusses it and tries to you know, involve other people who might have a, some input on, on, that, on such a matter, and reaches conclusions, eventually, we hope. Um, and if your proposals are good and useful, then the TEI will henceforth have a section on dealing with hot air balloons. 
Curiously, that hasn't happened yet. But there are other areas where this has happened in exactly this way. I mentioned earlier the uh, proposals for uh, physical aspects of documents, for example, and in particular for genetic editing and for incorporating musical notation. Both of those sets of proposals were created in exactly the way I've just described. So the TEI is no longer a research project. It's a community-driven effort. Its development and maintenance is driven by the Technical Council, which has an elected membership. Um, yes, okay. And it is responsible to the people who fund the organization by their membership in the consortium. If you are worried about the funding, by the way, you can be an individual member for only $60, $50, yes, $50 a year. Not a great deal. Which gives you the opportunity to vote <laughs> for members of the council and to stand for, as a member of the council. Please do. If the TEI is so flexible, if it's designed to incorporate all of these wonderful things, how can it also be a standard? The purpose of a standard is to define conformance. Right. So here's a, this slide here, which dates from a talk I gave in 91, was my first attempt to define the absolute bottom line of what, it, what are the TEI commandments. Mm -hmm. The first one is surprisingly difficult for people. I shall have no other encoding scheme beside me. What that means is, if you're using the TEI, you must use the TEI. Do not decide to represent um, italics by curly braces, just because that happens to be convenient. The TEI has a way of dealing with italics, and you must use that, otherwise you're not using the TEI. The second one, one of the consensus that my days may be long in this land, uh, <laughs> means that it is much better to adopt a solution that everybody agrees with, more or less, than it is to have a solution that one person thinks is absolutely fantastic and everybody else hates. Sad but true. <laughs> Boring old consensus lasts a lot longer than anything else. The third thing, and this is something really quite, uh, quite critical, people don't understand, that, well, we didn't have the concept of namespaces when uh, I enumerated, when I enunciated this commandment, we do now, so that helps. But thou shalt not take the GIs of this scheme in vain means if you use a TEI tag, shall we say, Q, you must use it to, with the sense that the TEI defines for that tag. You're not required to use Q, but if you do use it, then you must use it according to the way the TEI says you should use it. Otherwise, you're lying. And that doesn't help anybody. And the fourth one, thou shalt not commit polysemy. I'm not going to explain that. It's too rude. <laughs> okay. Um, so what does it mean then now? That was 1991. What does it mean today if you want to be conformant to the TEI? It means that you respect a consensus. It means that you use a lexicon that is predefined, but it also means you are respectful of diversity. So the TEI flavor of standardization is not the kind of standardization that says, do it like this, <laughs> but rather explain what you've done using a language that I can understand. And this is quite a different kind of standardization, I suggest. It does mean that there are many, many different flavors of TEI. Just to choose a very well-trodden um, problem area, or success, you might say, suppose you want to encode a bibliographic description, the author and title and publication data for a book. The TEI requires you, first of all, to make a choice. Shall I do it with a, a tag called Bibble, and TEI XML element Bibble, or another one called Bibblestruct? And there are some other ways, but those are the two chief ones. And really, it's up to you. You might want to do any of the following if you use Bibble. Bibble allows you just to say, hey, it's a bibliographic reference, guys. Blah, 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 blah. No substructure, no identification of the parts, jolly easy to print. Second one, on the other hand, 
Well, all right, I have distinguished the title, the author, the publisher. So now if I want to find all the books in my collection published by Larousse, I can pick them out as a publisher. In the third one, I've done a whole lot more. I've used all sorts of attributes to characterize different kinds of title and so on. Yeah. So there's a kind of a scale of increasing complexity in my analysis and consequently in my markup. I've used Bibblestruct by contrast. Everything is done for me. In Bibblestruct, the powers that be have said, this is how bibliographic description should be done. You will use these elements and only these elements. You are not allowed to put fluffy text floating about between the elements. You must give them in a particular order, and so on and so on. And I hope you can see that there is scope for both kinds of approach in the world. And that if the TEI were to choose only one of these two possibilities, it would not be very successful. Uh, I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to conclude by trying to answer the question with which I began. Why is the TEI still here? Why are you here listening to me? You may wish you weren't. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to answer that question in a kind of roundabout way, uh, using a, a, some ideas I stole from um, an English, uh, an American researcher called Henry Thompson. Henry said, there are two reasons why standards have failed in the past. One, they are based on a theory which is not yet mature, so they're just sort of random. And the other is the user community that you're aiming at is very fragmented or diverse and lots of people will say oh yeah I know you might want to do it like that but we don't do it like that <laughs> what we call not invented here or not in my backyard so how does the TEI try to address those try to avoid those two pitfalls on the road to success well one way of getting a mature theory is to test it properly and the TI actually makes it really easy to develop your own approach to marking something up using your own tags, using your own constraining your attributes in a particular way, adding semantic or other constraints such as codependency in your own way, removing elements you don't want, adding new elements from different namespaces. All of this is actually very easy in the TI. And that makes it very, very easy to test your theories while still remaining within the TEI church, while still remaining TEI conformant. As regards the not invented here problem, well, the TEI tries very hard to be hospitable to other approaches. Uh, it has a whole range of features for internationalization, and it is also, like any other XML system, very hospitable to other namespaces. So if you want to integrate graphics, use SVG, which is a very good XML standard for graphics. If you want to do maths, use MathML. If you want to do music, use MEI. All of those can be integrated into a TEI document. Furthermore, when you add new elements, you can map them, uh, you can map them onto other existing ontologies. Um, I'm, I'd like to talk a lot more about ontologies, but time is running out. My conclusion, Darwinism works. My conclusion is, basically, you can the reason that the TEI is still here is because it, is, it has used the lessons of natural selection. You can customize your TEI. You can change it. You can document your changes in a way the TEI recommends, discuss your revisions, propose useful corrections, and if you are right and your feature that you want to change is going to be useful to the whole community, then it will be integrated into the TEI, and you will be happy, but more to the point, the TEI will be better, and we will all profit from your work. So, the bottom line here is, join the consortium, work with the TEI, it's here for you. That's it, thank you. <laughs>